Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh in Hong Kong with another episode of the THD Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and checking this out. Today we have a Class D company from the Netherlands joining us. They're doing Class D amplifiers, DSP, power supplies for pro, hi-fi, and all the good, uh, exciting market spaces. Uh, but before we forget, let's remember that we have the Alti Association to thank for our sponsorship. Uh, we encourage everybody to check out that organization. Um, I know they're going to be next show is at, not until Munich next year in the Hi-Fi show. But without delay, let's get into uh, saying hello to everybody. So we have Simon Weston in Japan, as always. Good afternoon, Simon. Good afternoon, Dave. All right. And joining us, Niels Burma, the account manager at Hypex in the Netherlands. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Niels. Yeah, you're welcome, uh, Dave and Simon. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we've been uh, we've been trying to get you on for some time. Uh, you guys are in a kind of a, a special space. There's not too many players in your category and you guys do some neat stuff. So we wanted to get you on and find out about uh, your product and your offerings. Uh, there's some interesting things about your business and how you guys are pretty much vertically integrated with your own factory. And we're going to find out about that information as well. So maybe without delay, let's uh, get into your presentation. All right. Yeah. Um, thanks for uh, for uh, interviewing us and uh, giving us the opportunity to share something about um, uh, who we are and what we do. Um, really uh, keen on uh, on sharing this with everybody uh, of the viewers. Uh, so Hypex Electronics. Who are we? Uh, you already introduced us. We're from the Netherlands, uh, an innovative supplier. Um, and exactly what you already uh, mentioned in the introduction, our core business is Class D amplifiers. Um, and apart from that, uh, power supplies, switch mode, and indeed also some digital signal processing uh, to uh, complement our products. Um, as mentioned, an innovating supplier, we're always looking for, um, uh, for innovation, always um, improving our technologies, as we recently also introduced new technologies, which I will go into detail later, mm -hmm. uh, always to try uh, to, to be ahead of the game um, in the market. Uh, and as you said, there are not a lot of suppliers that are doing a, an excellent job in class D amplification. It's difficult. Um, so yeah, we, we put a lot of um, energy and time uh, and resources into uh, the innovating part. Uh, we're based in the Netherlands. Our headquarters is in the north, in Groningen, uh, which we, uh, where we uh, founded in uh, 1996, so already some time ago. Um, we also have an R&D office in Eindhoven, in the south of the Netherlands. That's more the um, technology uh, heart of uh, basically Western Europe. Uh, so a lot of uh, good engineers can be found there. Uh, so that's why we have an R&D office there as well. And as you mentioned, indeed, we have our own factory in Malaysia. Uh, we started that in 2012, already 11 years ago, um, just with the idea to have full control over the whole supply chain um, and over the, the quality controls and everything. Um, so, yeah, that's what we, uh, why we started that with, uh, with good, good results. Um, Founded in 1996 by our late uh, founder, Jan Peter van Ammerongen, died in uh, almost two years ago. Really unfortunate, but he left us a really good company, really nice company. Um, uh, still, the CEO now currently was already an employee at Hypex. So the integrity of our company hasn't been um, compromised or anything. Uh, we didn't get sold out or stuff like that. So that's what uh, everybody's really... Uh, really fond of. We are a close team. Um, we have very, uh, a very limited amount of um, hierarchy structure, so uh, not a lot of management layers or stuff like that. So we can get uh, things uh, done quickly, uh, short lines internally, uh, and that benefits our customers as well. So that's, um, yeah, that's always, uh, always really nice to have. R&D team um, is the biggest department of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, Hypex itself is around 30 employees. Almost half of that is R&D um, because, as mentioned before, we're doing a lot in the innovation part. Uh, so, yeah, need to put a lot of resources in that. Um, so, yeah, that's why our R&D team is um, yeah, multidisciplined and, uh, uh, yeah, the biggest team in the company. 
Okay. Um, since 2004, we actually only started with Class D. Before that, it was just Class A, B designs we did. We always didn't done our own designs. We never uh, bought technologies or anything. Already from the start, we developed everything ourselves. And since 2004, we started with Class D technology, with the UCD technology. Um, so, yeah, that's in a nutshell um, who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do, well, we are a specialized OEM supplier. That's the core business. We supply to um, uh, manufacturers, indeed, in hi-fi, high-end hi-fi, pro audio, studio monitors, um, um, uh, system integrators uh, for multi-channel amplifiers, stuff like that. Um, and we also supply the DOI market directly. It's not a core business. It's nice to have on the side. Um, we we often get the question, why? Why do you supply the DOI market? Because it's mm -hmm. a difficult market to supply. Well, yes and no. What we get out of it, the benefits, is that we get direct feedback of end users, not through our OEM customers that have their own end users. No, we get feedback from direct end customers. Um, and that's, that benefits us uh, in terms of what we need to develop, how we develop it, um, and what the features need to be of those products. Um, so yeah, it is a nice market to do, uh, to, to supply, and we are uh, loyal to them uh, because they have given us so much. Uh, we, 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 I think already from the start, we supplied to the DOI markets. Um, so yeah, we, we keep continuing that. It's, it's a yeah, small margin, uh, a small part of our uh, overall turnover, but it's still a nice market to supply. Um, so yeah, the most, um, um, yeah, most time goes into the OEM market. Um, we help our OEM customers with the full support on the system integration. We know our products. Uh, we know how to integrate them um, on, on, on every part, on heat dissipation, the cooling design of the, of the chassis, EMC designs and stuff like that. We know exactly um, how to implement that. And we are always keen on, on helping our customers making a, making a good design. Uh, it benefits us to do that already up front instead of finding out implementation errors when it's already in production. So would uh, customers be finding this in like big block hi-fi amplifiers as well as plate amplifiers on the back of powered speakers? Uh, what kind of devices would we see this in? Yeah, uh, exactly. We're complete active speakers for uh, high-end hi-fi, hi-fi studio monitors as well, and pro audio, of course. Um, it's nice to see also in the high-end hi-fi market, more and more uh, manufacturers are going into active speakers. Uh, they uh, they see the benefits of that now uh, as well. Uh, of course, in Pro Audio, it was already for many years the case uh, that they go for active systems. Mm -hmm. um, Multi-channel solutions for, um, for custom integrations. Uh, um, we do a lot of that as well. We supply solutions for 16 channels or more um, with their modular systems. So uh, all kinds of amplifier solutions. We have a vast um, amount of customers also with a musical instruments, but that's from bass guitar amps up to um, electronic church organs. We mm. have, uh, I think, I think we have we supply more than half of all the electronic church organ supplier uh, manufacturers in the world. So that's uh, that's a bit odd, but that we already do that for many years. Uh, and actually, um, many of those manufacturers are from the Netherlands. So. That's uh, yeah. that's also uh, also nice to have. But yeah, and ex exactly uh, everything that needs to have an ampli amplifier inside, uh, we supply for all kinds of solutions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and apart from uh, all our offerings of standard modules we have, we can do a lot of customizations. Uh, we do full custom designs uh, also for uh, for a few customers, but also just um, slight changes on our standard products. Uh, that's really easy to do for us. We can tune our products to whatever our customer would like to have it tuned. In general, our intention is um, the amplifier should be as neutral as possible. A lot of new customers or potential customers ask us, say, okay, looks nice on paper and 
DHD and everything really low, but how does your module sound? Actually, there's only one answer. It's it sounds like nothing, and then they usually look us uh, uh, look at us a bit bit odd and saying, "Well, what do you mean?" Well, you don't want your amplifier to sound like anything because it needs to amplify the input signal as good as it uh, it needs to be, but without colorization or uh, or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And so that's our general intention. It needs to be an amplifier for every solution, and it needs to amplify the signal. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, but there are still, of course, a lot of um, manufacturers, especially in hi-fi and high-end hi-fi, that like a certain sound signature, to say. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't really say colorization, because that's, I think, a negative thing, colorizing the sound, but a sound signature. So more emphasis on, on, the, on the low, mid, or high uh, section of the frequencies. Um, that's, uh, you know, uh, every brand has their own signature a bit on, on that. Mm-hmm. And we have a lot of knowledge in our um, designs to uh, to get that result that the customer wants. And that's just by component choices or tuning the, tuning the modules. Um, and we have a lot of knowledge in that and we can then do uh, customizations to, to supply basically um, yeah, each manufacturer in the industry. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we do, uh, actually in a nutshell. And how do we do that going into, uh, indeed the technologies, uh, on the amplifier techniques, we have now actually already four levels. We started in 2004 with the UCD technology, uh, originally patent from Philips, um, and, um, used by us already for many years. That was our first class D technology, uh, which we uh, integrated first in custom designs for studio monitors, actually. And later on, we developed indeed modules for the OEM market. Uh, Still our baseline technology. We have a a, a, um, a really nice family of separate amplifier modules, which you um, can design basically anything with uh, up to, yeah, multi-channel solutions to 32 channels, but also uh, indeed active speakers. You can build anything from it. Uh, Smallest modules are two times 100 watts up to two and a half kilowatt modules uh, for pro audio, especially. Mm -hmm. Uh, And combined with our separate power supplies, you have a really flexible system. So you can go um, yeah any kind of channel count with one power supply or two power supplies any kind of power per channel uh, it's a really flexible system so it um, it uh, yeah it can offer a, a lot of uh, different applications is that, um, an, is that an acronym ucd it stands for universal class d okay yeah so it's uh, it, it is indeed an acronym but uh, yeah really uh, it, it is exactly what what it says universal it's really for uh, for everything. It's already really good hi-fi quality. Uh, so it's it is our baseline technology and basically our worst sounding module, but actually already really good amplifier. Um, one of the first class D technologies back back then in uh, basically uh, 2008, 2009, that already showed the world that the class D amplifier doesn't need to sound bad. It was already a good sounding amplifier. Later on, we have our uh, own patent uh, on Encore. We started mm-hmm. the development of that in that 2008 and patented it in 2011. We started using this technology in, uh, in modules and complete solutions um, more intended indeed for high and hi-fi. We showed the world with Encore that class D can also compete with really good class AB and class AMs. Um, it was the first class D technology that sh- showed that class D is uh, uh, coming coming in other markets where uh, where audio quality is really critical. Um, so that was really really nice to see. Um, also, manufacturers in high end hi fi uh, jumping on board on the class D train, so to speak, for the first time because we proved class D has the benefits of the less heat dissipation and everything and smaller designs. Um, so it can be a cheaper amplifier as well because you need less big parts and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but still get the good sound quality you would need for such uh, such applications. Can we take um, a quick tangent just on that point. So what what are the what is the what is it that historically made a class D amplifier sound worse than a class A or class AB amplifier? That is a really good question. Um, 
t- really technical, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I do know that a class D design from origin um, isn't isn't a, a topology that really uh, wants to um, um, how do you say amplify the signal that is coming in. Basically, you really need to to keep full control of of uh, what is going on in the uh, in the technology and in the circuitry. And uh, there are several different topologies in class D. We always have uh, self oscillating. Uh, amplifiers with with feedback. Um, uh, a lot of uh, people also believe uh, an amplifier with feedback is a negative thing, um, but that's a part of our topology. And um, but that's also the reason why our amplifiers are that good because we have um, we have developed uh, uh, we have developed that part of the technology uh, really well and uh, improve that over the years as well with our new technologies. Okay, uh, could, could we say, could it be said a bit like this then that um, a, a historic, I'm assuming your historic class D amplifier would not reproduce the waveform quite as perfectly as a class A or class yeah. AB amplifier? In, in low frequencies, it was easy. Uh, so for yeah. bass, for subs and everything, it was easy and, uh, and the class D amplifier was good enough. And then you have the benefits of a class D amplifier being fast high damping factor, so full control of the of your subwoofer. And for subwoofer, that then the harmonic distortion is maybe not so good, is mm-hmm. less obvious uh, and not, not really hearable. Uh, but going into the mid-range and especially the high frequency ranges, it was just terrible. The, 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 the distortion was just too bad and you couldn't, the, the historical class D amplifiers we're not good enough on on performance uh, wise on the on the on the harmonic distortion and everything. So yeah, that's why it wasn't used in in hi-fi uh, applications or high-end hi-fi applications. Mm-hmm. And that's but, nothing to do with the filtering that's related to uh, how well controlled the pulsing is and things like that, is it? Uh, well, it has to do with that as well. And um, in generally speaking. Um, Already back in the years when first class D amplifiers were out there, you could still already, uh, with with the technology available then, you could make a good class D amplifier, but it was just not invented yet. Um, And that's since the UCD technology, it was actually, that was the period and the time when um, the the good topologies were invented, where um, also theoretically the calculations on, on the model, the class D model, were were invented so and to uh, yeah and then good day the knowledge came uh, how to actually do it properly yeah, um, yeah yeah because if you look at our designs we use we use a lot of discrete uh, some uh, some competitors of us use a lot of uh, ICs as well um, but uh, of course there are more and more ICs out there now with class D technology our designs are still completely discrete um, just using transistors and such. Um, so that's that's not new technology. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, also on on each uh, component, uh, there are innovations over the years. So you get new uh, new transistors and everything. But um, yeah, it's it's complete discrete designs, and that's why we also have full control of the complete class D topology in terms of the modulator, the um, the steering the comparator. We can control every aspect of of what is happening there. Um, instead of just using a chip, which yeah, is basically locked in how it does. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So since um, almost two years in now, we introduced our new technologies, Encore X and Nilai. Mm-hmm. Encore X is really an improvement on Encore. Um, what we did there is, uh, as I mentioned before, we always have. Um, amplifiers with uh, self-oscillating amplifiers with with feedback and that feedback loop is where we could make um, a, a lot of changes with the anchor x we have um, improved that feedback loop of encore um, so you get uh, indeed nice improvements on that we have um, the the if you look at uh, the amount of loop gain we 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 have added because of uh, if you have more feedback, you have more loop gain. The loop gain is uh, at least plus six dBs more compared to Encore in the high frequency range. But in the low frequency range, it goes up to plus 18 dB. Um, that's also the big change. With Encore and UCD, we always um, chosen 
to tune the module with flap loop gain. Um, it has, um, it always has benefited us in terms of sound quality. When we did the developments on Anchor X and Eli, we actually experimented a lot with, is that the best way to do a flat loop gain or not? Because we could easily make uh, even higher loop gain in the lower frequencies without compromising in the high frequencies. And we listened to that. We did tuning, we did measurements, and you see indeed the loop gain changes, but that wasn't where we stopped. We listened to it and say, how does it sound? So put all the equipment aside and just hook it up and listen to it. That's what we did a lot with Anchor X and Eli. Tune the modules really by ear. Um, also, um, yeah, with a lot of people just putting all the opinions uh, uh, um, uh, in a row and see, okay, how do we like our modules to sound? Um, and uh, the feedback we get now from our customers for with Anchor X and Eli is just astonishing uh, and uh, proves that uh, uh, to ourselves that we made a good choice. Um, so yeah, the tuning on the modules we, we did now uh, differently than we previously did. But also on that part, we can do customizations. If an OEM customer prefers a different tuning of the module, we can do that. So that's um, now we have a lot of uh, playroom uh, in our techniques um, to to yeah to fiddle around with the settings of the module. So that's really neat to have, which we previously didn't do. We just leave the settings uh, alone and just just did some component swaps. But now we can offer our customers full tuning of the module, so to speak, and that's really nice uh, nice to have now. With Anchor X, we really aim for um, uh, still price competitive. So we going to use this more and more in future OEM products. We're going to upgrade uh, existing Encore line as well uh, to Encore X uh, to benefit, of course, the sound quality, but also in terms of heat dissipation. The idle losses and everything also can be improved because of the better class D topology. Um, and that's also something we can tune between if we have an high and high fi customer that says, I can put in uh, five kilograms of heat sinking in my chassis, no problem at all. Uh, just make this module sound as good as it can be. And I don't care about the heat dissipation. We can tune the module to optimize to uh, the sound quality. But if it needs to be used in, for example, a 16 channel um, amplifier for uh, zone amplification and stuff like that, then maybe heat dissipation gets more important. So we can tune also to have it uh, uh, have the less heat dissipation and tune it more for the idle losses, uh, still benefiting on the sound quality improvements as well. With Nilai, that's really the new benchmarking class D technology. What we did there with the feedback loop and the loop gain is, um, is uh, just an, another way to do it. Um, instead of just improving the loop gain used on Encore, we done it in a different way. Uh, cannot really go into detail in how we exactly did it, but it does uh, mean it adds an additional five, 15 dB of, of, uh, of loop gain compared to Encore. Um, so that's a really, really nice step upwards. Um, the technology is, uh, uh, again, with Anchor X, we can also tune whatever we like. But with Neelai, we really want to be um, competing to the best class A amplifiers out there in high-end hi-fi. And we know we can. Um, so, yeah, that's really, really nice to have. At the moment, we only have a DOI module. Uh, we yeah, just decided to start with a really nice DOI module. Um, was intended actually to launch two years ago, um, but during uh, the COVID years with all the supply chain issues, it was yeah. only launched last year. But two years ago, we had our 25th anniversary. Um, so that's why we wanted to launch the module uh, as an anniversary uh, unit for the DUI market. Unfortunately, one year late, but it is here now we can supply. Um, but that technology will indeed also be implemented then in OEM products. Uh, eventually. Um, out of, out of uh, curiosity, go hold on. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, out of curiosity, using mostly discrete components versus ICs, was the component shortage during uh, COVID and such, was that easier to manage or more difficult? 
uh, in general easier um, because we use uh, not an, uh, a, a gate drive IC or uh, 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 or anything like that or a class D chip. Um, then you are relying on just one supplier that can supply that chip because it's in a unique exactly. part. Mm -hmm. Because we use indeed discrete designs and use a lot of transistors, you have basically 10 or 20 different suppliers of the transistor. Now, because it's completely discrete and it is really um, complex technology, uh, we cannot use all, the, all of the 15 manufacturers. On mm -hmm. each position, we can maybe only use four or five different manufacturers, uh, but that's the knowledge we have. But still, we have alternatives to choose from. And yes, um, each time when a ch chip or uh, each time when a component uh, is uh, uh, has a long lead time, we need to um, test it uh, and and uh, yeah, trial and error to see which alternative component does work. Um, which we previously didn't test out now. But uh, in generally speaking, we didn't have really big issues. Uh, we hear horror stories of uh, uh, stories of more than 12 month lead times on stuff on yep. products. We never had that. We had a few months delays uh, sometimes with products, but we could still manage and uh, change the designs and uh, continue production again relatively quickly. Um, so yeah, that, that we were lucky with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Simon? Yeah, I was. Um, uh, I, get, I get the impression that your design there's no microprocessor in the design. Well, we still that? use some microprocessor, but that's more for the protections. And some modules have a I squared C connection for communication, so you can use it in software mode for controlling the module and reading out temperatures and stuff like that, and all the other protections. So we use a microprocessor for uh, for all the controls, but the actual class D design itself. Uh, we use op amps, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, in, in the really high end stuff, we uh, we developed our own op amps, also completely discrete. Uh, we developed our own uh, voltage regulators for auxiliary voltages, uh, like twelve volts for the op amps. We also made completely discrete designs. Uh, so yeah, we know we know how to develop a really high end product as well. So uh, before talking to you now, I was under the impression that uh, class D amplifiers used a microprocessor to generate a PWM signal. Is that not, is that not what a class D no, is? It's a self-oscillating amplifier. So it's it's not uh, with a, um, a switching frequency uh, generated by an, uh, by an IC or anything. Okay, is that, um, uh, is that kind of unique or is that the normal, is that a very standard way that it's done for this type of amplifier? Uh, I think for, for each self-oscillating amplifier, it's it's uh, it's gen, it's normal. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what what our uh, all our competitors do. Uh, I do know that Purify does relatively the same as we do. Um, um, what Icepower and Pascal, I think they use more chips. Like Icepower, they have their own uh, chips uh, developed and stuff like that. Um, so there are more topologies to use and. And how to uh, generate the switching frequency? Actually, I'm not sure how they do it, uh, yeah. but it is for self-oscillating amplifier. It's common to, uh, okay. to not have that with, done by a processor. Uh, so it's almost like an analog digital amplifier. <laughs> it's completely analog. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so the input signal is a uh, is an analog uh, signal of uh, like a single ended. Analog we always have balanced balanced inputs on all and our balanced amplifiers. inputs. Yeah, yeah, fully and, balanced. And, all right, so there's actually no there's no uh, A to D in, uh, as such. This signal is just driving the whole system. Exactly. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it it is indeed completely analog amplifier, and uh, that's always, of course, a lot of um, uh, uh, confusion with a lot of people mm -hmm. that think class D stands for digital, uh, but it's just the next letter in the alphabet. Uh, that's the only thing. <laughs> that's literally only the thing. Of course, you have class D uh, digital designs with a digital input and everything. Those exist as well. But the majority of class D amplifiers, especially the good ones, um, are all analog designs. Interesting. So uh, is there is another category of digital class D amplifiers then? Yeah, there are. Yeah, yeah. I'm not exactly familiar in what offerings. So of course, a lot of Class D chips out there from a lot of brands are Class D digital designs uh, as well. In the uh, module market where we uh, operate, most are analog. Yeah. 
Okay, very good, very good. Thanks. Um, on the amplifier techniques, well, uh, that's um, yeah the four different levels of techniques we currently offer. Of course, more and more new designs will be based on the new technologies we have because we yeah we have so much more benefits with that in in terms of sound quality and idle losses. Um, so new designs will not be based on the older technologies, um, but still the uh, UCD technology we have. Uh, really nice price competitive offerings. So it's still being implemented as well in new designs. Um, so that's uh, that's really nice. Uh, one more, actually, one more thing. Um, uh, in the past, that I'd encountered class D amplifiers uh, that use some capacitors and inductors as an output filter. Is that uh, is that something that you use too? Well, yeah, yeah because you have a, 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 the self oscillating design, you need to have the uh, the switching frequency filtered out at the end, so that's an uh, that's an LC network basically. Okay, but that's that's already embedded on the uh, on the module itself. Yeah, don't need additional filtering, but that's already um, uh, embedded on the design. That's correct. Yeah, uh, that switching frequency would be well beyond the audible range. Is it filtered out for? Uh, it drives too much power into the speaker, or what? Uh, no, it is switching frequency usually is around 400 kilohertz with our designs. Depends a bit on which uh, which technology and which modules. Uh, and that's completely filtered out indeed. Uh, hardly measurable at the end. Uh, yeah. I mean, is there a reason to filter it out? Why, why filter it out? Uh, it's uh, it, it definitely needs to be filtered out because you have harmonics and everything um, uh, on that switching frequency. Uh, you don't want that on the output. Because it, yeah, it produces a lot of noise. You don't get the THD figures we get if you don't filter that out. Um, yeah. Okay. Hmm. So, so basically, the subharmonics of that four hundred K come back into the audio path. Uh, yeah, I do believe so. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Um, so yeah, yeah. If we, do you have more questions on the amplifier techniques or? <laughs> Okay, then one more. Uh, is there any limitations in terms of uh, impedance load of the speakers? Uh, there is always a limit because you don't uh, uh, don't want a short circuit. I should say in another way, is it is it any in any way different to a uh, class A class AB amplifier? Uh, it is different, but uh, if you have a well uh, well designed, then uh, the stability of the amplifier is really important, and our designs are really stable. So uh, a single ended amplifier can can easily drive a one ohm load. If okay. you go be, be uh, below that, it doesn't really uh, benefit uh, the the overall power that you get because you run into current limiting. Uh, because there is always a limiting current what you can do with the modules, of course. Um, but yeah, a single ended amplifier from us, uh, each of the technologies, each of the modules can easily do one ohm loads. Basically, yeah, they are stable. Yes. Okay. And then um, I was always curious, um, you may not be able to answer this one, but uh, uh, what is it that makes a Class D amplifier more efficient than a Class A or Class AB amplifier? In, in general, it, it's the same with the switch mode power supplies. If you, um, if you need to amplify the signal and you do that in lower frequencies, you will have more idle losses. Uh, that's generally speaking, not going too too technical on it. And so, if you modulate that first, that same signal on a four hundred kilohertz um, um, uh, frequency, then you have a much higher frequency signal in general to amplify, and that can be easily done uh, more efficiently. So then, your um, uh, the the power fats and everything can can be much smaller and uh, operate much more more efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, the higher switching frequency you can operate on, the efficient, more efficient the module will get. Um, and that's also with uh, the current trend is, of course, using GAN FETs, for example. GAN mm -hmm. FETs gives you the benefit that you can operate on a, a much, much higher switching frequency. So benefiting the overall uh, efficiency of the module. Um, the disadvantages of using much higher frequency is that you uh, it gets more complex to actually make a really good amplifier. 
so currently there is a trend, of course, using GenFed because of all the benefits, but it still uh, leaves you with the challenge to actually develop and design a good sounding amplifier. Um, usually a lot of people think, okay, GenFed is the future. You, you get automatically a good amplifier with it. In terms of heat dissipation, yes, definitely. You can run kilowatt amplifier without any heat sinking and everything like that. But actually sounding good uh, is another, uh, another thing. Uh, but yeah, that it's, of course, we also uh, recognize the future of these kinds of technologies. And um, as we are innovating, we're always uh, looking in new technologies as well. Currently, no plans on the roadmap yet, but of course, looking into these technologies as well for our own uh, our own designs. Yeah. Mm. So that uh, the thing about the uh, heat sinking and the efficiency are the, uh, actually saying the same thing. That's what it comes down to is heat loss. Yes. Yeah. Our amplifiers are in generally uh, percentage wise around 92, 93% efficient. Uh, depends on how much power you draw out of it because there's a certain idle current. So running the modules in idle without uh, an, an input signal, then they are least efficient. Um, but running more and more power out of it, they are more efficient. Um, uh, and that's a calculation of how much uh, uh, power you put into the system and how much you dis dissipate across a speaker coil? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so as you, as you approach no signal, then the efficiency goes to zero, basically, because nothing happens well yeah of course because yeah you, yeah. you don't you, indeed you don't get any power out of your speaker without an input signal so yeah, yeah, yeah. it goes into heat loss um yeah. but but still of course with a class d design that's uh relatively speaking but uh uh yeah the module gets already warm when you turn it on but the nice thing is if you draw full power it doesn't get really that much hotter so I that's, see. Uh, yeah yeah um okay so yeah, for a good amplifier, you need a good power supply. So that's why we develop our own power supplies. So we have that uh, under control as well. Uh, and to, to of course, uh, offer a, a, a complete solution for our customers as well. Uh, power supplies are really crucial uh, in the node audio amplifier as well, also for sound quality. Um, so uh, yeah, that's why we develop our own power supplies. Uh, and of course we have, like you see in the background, one of our Encore uh, mains powered amplifier modules. This is the NC502 MP, which is a two times 500 watt module complete with power supply and standby power supply. So this is basically one of our Encore building blocks, which uh, our customers can implement for um, a subwoofer, a stereo amplifier, uh, uh, active speakers, or uh, using multiple for multi-channel is also, uh, also optional. So, um, that's why we make uh, power supplies as well. And on top of that, basically the the, the final part of the triangle is the DSP processors. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, we don't have a lot of solutions yet in the DSP uh, processing. We have a really nice line of plate amplifiers, also complete for manufacturers and the DIY market, and offer those um, uh, boards, uh, including the DSP board, also for OEMs. Um, working on uh, expanding that portfolio in DSPs for the nearby future. Um, so yeah, that's a market uh, which has a lot of demand as well. A lot of manufacturers want to have a one-stop shop for their electronics, uh, especially for active speakers. A lot of manufacturers are used to making passive speakers, so they don't know anything about electronics. So they want, yeah, to want to work with a partner that knows what they are doing, that can help them out with implementing, can help them out uh, making the uh, most optimized speaker design on the filtering and everything. So yeah, we um, with all the technology we have, uh, we can supply uh, everything needed for, for active speakers. All right. Just quickly on power supplies. Uh, when talking about power supplies, in your case, it's always transforming mains power into a DC voltage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We only have uh, AC power supplies, uh, so universal mains uh, uh, usually. So uh, 115 volts to 230 volts. So worldwide implementation is no problems. We don't have any solutions for 12 volts or any mobile uh, audio applications. Uh, we have uh, we we do get the questions a lot uh, if we make something for car car audio, but it's such a different market to compete with as well is really difficult. Um, uh, so yeah, we have 
chosen to uh, to not be involved in that market. Um, but still, if uh, another manufacturer makes a nice power supply working from 12 volts, can convert that to the voltages needed for our amplifiers, it can still be used for our amplifiers. And then on the DSP stuff, um, uh, what do your customers actually want the DSP to do? Is it e to uh, do some equalization or some other effects? Yeah, speaker filtering. So if you have a three-way design, you want, of course, each uh, uh, each channel to be filtered uh, to have the proper uh, filtering for your speaker. Uh, you can do, indeed, equalization on the input as well. Uh, you can set up all kinds of different parameters uh, because the amplifier modules connected to the RDSP are uh, equipped with a standby power supply as well. So we have, uh, with a standby power supply, power supply, you have, of course, standby features, which you can implement in active speakers. Uh, you have automatic signal detection in our DSP processor, uh, so it can uh, wake up out of standby when a signal is detected on one of the inputs, uh, automatic input switching on signal detection, everything like that. Um, so all those kinds of features can be set up with that as well. So that uh, enables our customers to make an active speaker for studio or for hi-fi uh, with a lot of um, uh, with a lot of features, what they are already looking for. Basically, with our DSP, you can eliminate any preamplifier. You can go directly in with any source, digital or analog. It has both inputs, mm -hmm. uh, balanced and unbalanced on on both uh, sides. Uh, so yeah, you can run it without uh, without a preamplifier. There's also digital volume control, which you can even um, have an option to control that with an uh, IR remote. Mm. Okay. Uh, do your engineers feel that adding a DSP on the front of it ruins the whole purity of a, of a system that operates purely analog signal to analog signal out? Uh, yes and no. If you indeed have the intention to use the amplifier for really high end hi-fi, we also have the opinion that if you're setting up a hi-fi system or a high end hi-fi system in your home, each part of your system needs to be uh, perfect on its own. So um, you don't want equalization, basically. Of course, uh, with, a, with uh, especially uh, with DRAC and stuff like that, that's really easy to tune your room because uh, the room is part of your system. It's one of those components in your system. It's mm -hmm. not just the preamplifier, your sources, the cabling and your amplifiers and speakers. Your room is part of the one of the parts of your uh, system, of course, which also creates a lot of distortion in your overall audio uh, picture. Uh, so that's nice features to have direct, but it's still equalization. So we we believe as well that the speaker already should sound good, that the amplifier should sound good. Um, but the benefits of making an active speaker uh, you can make the speaker itself a much better uh, uh, part of your system uh, because you are limited when you create a speaker with a passive filter. Um, so we see the benefits in using a DSP and an active speaker. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, the extra conversions you, uh, you go through uh, going from analog to digital and back again. Um, yeah, it's disadvantage, but... The advantages of DSP uh, overrule the disadvantages, we believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just another uh, thing, uh, uh, the distribution of signals is still predominantly done as an analog signal, but uh, pretty much everyone is sourcing their audio from a digital source. So does that seem strange to you? Would there be a trend towards distributing uh, the signal digitally? Uh, for our amplifiers, uh, no, not at the moment. Um, because it's completely analog design, we would need to do to implement the conversion on it. We cannot go di directly digital in the amplifier itself. It's always uh, needs an analog input for our topology. Mm -hmm. um, so you would need to do the conversion on board. It makes life easier for the manufacturer, but then they also have no choice on how the conversion is being done. Uh, our intention is for our OEM manufacturer clientele is um, whole front end, what you put in front of the amplifier, so all the pre-amplifier section or any conversion from digital to analog, they can choose what they want to implement, what kind of chip they want to use or or how advanced they want to have that um, implemented. Uh, so yeah, they can do that for themselves and we just supply the, uh, 
the powerhouse itself. Right. Okay. okay. And so um, what you supply is generally a PCBA and somebody builds that into their own housing? Uh, yeah, the, the majority of our uh, uh, of the markets and customers we supply are modules. We are a module uh, sub-assembly uh, supplier, basically. So what you see in the background is one of those modules being used in um, in subwoofers as well. You can bridge the two channels, so you have a kilowatt amplifier. Um, and this module, because it has the main power supply, it has an output with auxiliary voltages and a five volt standby line as well. So you can power all your auxiliary uh, auxiliary electronics with it. So the whole DSP platform in your subwoofer or in your stereo amplifier or other active speaker designs can be powered off our module. Um, and yeah, then you have the analog inputs and loudspeaker output on a module. So the customer can develop their own front end, however they would like to have it. With, with all kinds of different inputs uh, they would uh, like to have. Right, and right, 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 right. Use, Yeah, use our building block as the as the core of the design. Yep. Mm. Yeah, got it. Okay. All right. Um, and basically, last, why we do it. Um, it's fun. Audio market, we love it, definitely. I think... I think 80% of all, all uh, personnel of Hypex has uh, affiliation with audio. Is it in pro? Is it just musicians? Is it uh, just hi-fi lovers and uh, like to listen to music? Uh, of course, who doesn't like to listen to music? You know, um, as I mentioned, music is emotion. That's uh, we really strongly have the opinion that uh, with music, you can... Um, you can establish so much uh, in terms of how you feel. You know, if you have a bad day and you just put on some music and listen to a really good audio system and uh, playing your favorite tracks, uh, it, it changes your mood instantly, basically. Um, we really believe that uh, that is really important. And to have the equipment to, to, uh, yeah, to reproduce that, uh, to establish such emotions, um, yeah, we we feel we uh, we do an excellent job in uh, in making that possible on the uh, amplifier side. At least uh, it's up to our customers to to do it on the uh, loudspeaker side or or all the others, but uh, other parts. But um, yeah, now we are really passionate about music in general, and um, we we just love to do it. As you can see in the background, is a big part of our team uh, on the. Mm -hmm on a show in uh, the high-end show in Munich, where we also exhibit always each year. Um, we always love that show, mm -hmm. uh, what you see there. And uh, yeah, all the customers we uh, we talk with uh, each year. We um, we love that. Yes. Okay. I think that's universal. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. That's universal. And actually, because of our passion for music and passion for uh, for, 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 for audio, uh, we, we also already many years back we started our own high-end hi-fi company called Mola Mola. And not a lot of people are aware of that. It's, uh, it's not a well-known brand uh, yet. We are growing, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a separate company under the Hypex Holding where we develop complete products from a pre-amplifier to uh, a deck and a phono stage add-on and uh, also a separate deck and phono stage, now also in offerings. And of course, in the amplifier section as well, we do some unique stuff. Um, Hypex is, of course, the, the the developer and manufacturer of these products, but we use this brand really as uh, also on the uh, power supply section and all the other sections. We use it as an innovation platform. We can really think out of the box and not look at any budgets at all uh, because it's a high-end brand, which you know can have a, a big price tag. Uh, there is a market for it. Um, and so everything we developed for uh, for Mola Mola uh, can eventually um, also be implemented in uh, in Hypex products in the future as well. So that's a really need to have uh, have as well such a brand in house. Okay, so it sounds like we're coming to the end of the presentation here. Yeah, that was my last sheet. Um, All right. Yeah, if you have any uh, other additional questions, and, uh, uh, one more thing: your DIY stuff. Where do we? Where does someone buy that from? distributed worldwide 
Yeah, we have a reseller network uh, worldwide with uh, mostly web shops, but also uh, physical shops. We have our own web shop as well. Dedicated website, doiclassd.com is our own DOI website where mm -hmm. we offer our DOI products. Um, the, on the amplifier side, that's also completely separated. We have uh, separate amplifier modules for the DOI market and separate amplifiers for the OEM market. Um, and the DOI market cannot buy those OEM parts. And we really uh, have a strong feeling in, in keeping that separated because when a manufacturing customer uses one of our OEM amplifier modules and does a lot of uh, developments on making a really nice finished product with that module, and then um, a DUI customer can buy the same amplifier as mm. well and make their own. Um, yeah, we don't think that's really a positive thing. So that's why on the amplifier side, we keep that completely st strictly separated. Uh, power supplies, it's it's equal. It's uh, it's basically yeah. You need a power supply to 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 run the amplifier, so that's uh, uh, we don't uh, see that as a as a main important part of the chassis or the designs. So that's basically the similar uh, what we offer. Uh, and the, the blade amplifiers can be used for DOI customers as well to make their own active speakers uh, for yeah. their home system. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, all right. So I think uh, we'll put some links down below in the description for everybody to follow up if they want more information or would like to order some parts for themselves. Uh, um, but uh, Niels, I uh, really appreciate you joining us today. It was fantastic and uh, gave you gave you some good uh, gave us some good Q and A on that on the uh, amplifiers and a bit bit more elucidating. I think that we learned a little bit today. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. So, uh, yeah, encourage everybody to like, subscribe, and share this video out to anybody you think is interested. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you.